Well, I've just published this uh, magnificent book on <laughs> humour. I, I, I keep rereading it just to relish the wit and the wordplay and the, <laughs> the swift perceptiveness of it all. I, in fact, it's very hard for me to tear myself away from it to come here. <laughs> so, and the first chapter of it, as you'll find out very shortly when you buy a copy, um, <laughs> is uh, on laughter. And its epigraph is uh, actually an old joke from Bob Monkhouse. You've probably heard it. They laughed when I said I wanted to be a comedian. Well, they're not laughing now. <laughs> Samuel Johnson, always an excellent way to start a sentence, Samuel Johnson remarked somewhere that though human beings have been wise in different ways, they've always laughed in the same way. Now, that's surely doubtful, isn't it? I mean, laughter is a language with a whole host of different idioms. Um, cackling, chortling, grunting, chuckling, shrieking, bellowing, screaming, sniggering, gasping, shouting, braying, yelping. I go on like this for half an hour, actually. Uh, roaring, tittering, hooting, guffawing, snorting, howling, screeching, bellowing, snickering, and so on. What do I, what do I understand? There's a prize for somebody who... Uh, Giggling, yes. Prize. The prize is you can buy two copies of this book. <laughs> one of the paradoxes of laughter is, in one sense, it's a pure enunciation without any, uh, which expresses nothing but itself in a way, without any inherent sense in a way like music. But uh, though it la though it lacks intrinsic sense, rather like an animal's cry, Descartes uh, described laughter as. Um, um, an inarticulate and explosive cry, but despite that fact, despite the fact that it's in a way a matter purely of the signifier, yes, it doesn't have a meaning or signified, uh, it's richly laden with cultural significance. Yes. So it's sort of, as it were, on the cusp of nature and culture. Um, not only has laughter no inherent meaning in the way that a sentence does, but at its most riotous or convulsive, it involves the disintegration of meaning as the body tears one's speech to fragments and the id pitches the ego into temporary disarray. As with grief or severe pain or extreme fear or blind rage, uh, truly uproarious laughter, of course, involves a loss of physical self-control as the body, body gets momentarily out of hand and we regress to the uncoordinated state of the, of the infant. Laughter, laughter is quite literally a bodily disorder. Um, there's something alarmingly animal about it, uh, not least the kind of noise it involves, you know, hooting, braying, cackling, neighing, here I go again, bellowing and so on, um, which calls to mind our affinity with the other animals, which is strange because the other animals don't laugh themselves, at least not conspicuously. So Darwin thought that monkeys chuckled when you tickle them. I don't know if anybody's tickled a monkey recently <laughs> to uh, try and put this to the test. Um, so that in this sense, oddly, laughter is at once uh, animal and distinctively human. It's a miming of the noise of the beast, on the one hand, yet it's quite unbeast-like itself. Laughter signifies, uh, but it also involves a breakdown of signification into pure spasm, breath, sound, rhythm, and so on. It represents, in one sense, the temporary collapse or derangement of what we might call the symbolic order of meaning, while in another sense, it continues always to rely upon it because we laugh for some kind of reason, yes? Normally speaking, except that laughter can, of course, generate more laughter than that. It becomes contagious. You know, where we don't even know what we're laughing at, except we're laughing at laughing. So uh, laughter is, a, is an utterance which springs straight from the libidinal depths of the body. Um, but there's a cognitive dimension to it as well, as there is to all emotions. All emotions, emotions involve ideas of some kind, yes? We're laughing at something, after all. Infants smile almost from birth, but laughter begins only around the third or fourth month, perhaps 
of its need to engage the mind in some way. Laughter isn't always a laughing matter. There's a cliché for you. Um, there have even been lethal epidemics of the stuff in China, Africa, Siberia, and elsewhere. Mass historical paroxysms in which, so it's alleged, thousands of people have died, died literally of laughter. Um, in 1962, one such outbreak um, in what was then Tanganyika uh, immobilized whole school districts for months on end. And since being out of control is never entirely pleasurable, laughter can easily border on the unpleasant, like being tickled, for example. Um, so I'm told I've never actually been tickled, you know, but tried it. people have told my fr friend tells me that you know being tickled. Uh, um, uh, and in fact, Johnson, Samuel Johnson, in his dictionary, defines laughter as convulsive merriment, which is almost an oxymoron, isn't it? Almost self-contradictory, like um, business ethics. Or something. <laughs> my my favourite oxymoron. Samuel Beckett once said he had a strong weakness for an oxymoron. <laughs> um, <laughs> lying through his teeth, the narrator of Lawrence Stern's great novel, Tristram Shandy, tells us he once laughed so hard that he broke a blood vessel and lost four pints of blood in two hours. Uh, the novelist Anthony Trollope suffered a stroke while laughing at a comic novel a misfortune by which few of his own readers are likely to be <laughs> afflicted. <laughs> so you can as it, treat language as la laughter as a kind of text, if you like, uh, or as a language with so many different regional accents. Um, you know, upper-class Englishmen are more likely to bray than middle-class Englishwomen, who perhaps are more given to tinkling, yes? <laughs> Uh, military generals tend not to giggle or popes to cackle, for example. <laughs> the president of the World Bank is permitted to laugh heartily, but not hysterically. You know, he <laughs> might begin to have economic worries if he starts laughing <laughs> hysterically. Quite a lot of humour involves what Freud calls desublimation. That's to say, basically debunkery, puncturing. Um, you know, the energies that we invest in some ideal or just in some meaning or value, really, it doesn't have to be that ideal, are um, released as laughter. Those psychic energies are released in the form of laughter when the ideal is rudely punctured. Because sustaining ideals uh, involves, or even values, involves a certain degree of psychical strain. Uh, so not having to do so can be a pleasurable sensation. We're now free from having to maintain a reputable moral front uh, and can reap the delectable fruits of being shamelessly crude, cynical, selfish, lecherous, insulting, morally indolent, emotionally anaesthetized and outrageously self-indulgent. All of which, of course, is very pleasant. Um, <laughs> but we can also be enjoyably released according to psychoanalytic theory, not only from, uh, from the from <coughs> ideals, but from the very exigencies of sense-making, um, our continual and routine sense-making itself, psychoanalytically, involves a degree of psychical investment, yes, um, what Freud calls the compulsion of logic, a process which involves unwelcome constraints on the anarchic id, the anarchic unconscious. So, hence our delight in the surreal or absurd, a world in which anything is possible, in which lo which is unshackled from logic, as for example in one of the goon shows that uh, some people here will remember, and since I was born in the early years of the Industrial Revolution, I certainly remember it, well, in which um, they, the, the, they had a crafty idea of floating a life-size cardboard replica of the British Isles off the British Isles to bamboozle German bombers when they were <laughs> coming over, that kind of thing. Um, remaining serious, in other words, psychologically speaking or psychoanalytically speaking, involves uh, successful repression, a mild kind of repression, not a crippling neurotic repression. And joking is therefore a brief vacation from the mild oppressiveness of meaning. Jokes buck the tyranny 
of what Freud calls the reality principle. Uh, they afford us a certain infantile satisfaction uh, as we regress to a condition which predates the jealously enforced divisions and precisions of the symbolic order and are able to throw logic, uh, linearity, congruity and so on to the winds. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.